Greetings, Dr. Mark Winton here from the Department of Criminal Justice at the University of Central Florida. And um, I am going to present some of my original research. This um, uh, was presented uh, at the 2019 annual meeting of the Homicide Research Working Group. And um, you can check them out online, the Homicide Research Working Group is just a fantastic and supportive group of um, researchers, academics, uh, practitioners, law enforcement officers, attorneys, people who have an interest in studying homicide and you have some of the really um, uh, well-known uh, researchers and, and uh, authors attending the conference. And the nice thing is getting feedback because I will tell you right away in this um, paper that I'm going to present to you right now, half the time I'm not sure what I'm doing. And it's a work in progress, an ongoing work in progress. I know, I know some of you are saying he doesn't know what he's doing. Um, is that bad or is that, you know, is that job security or lack of it? Or No, definitely need to do a lot more. And I've been working at this research for um, a good, you know, 15 years or so. And um, hopefully it will um, uh, get you asking some, some questions about, about serial murder. The title is Rapid Onset of the Violentization Process, a Case Study of Serial and Mass Murder During Genocide. One of the things that I think I've mentioned, um, if I haven't already, I'll mention it now, is that on the one hand I teach the serial murder class. On the other hand, I teach a graduate and undergraduate course on genocide. Um, when I was teaching serial murder and genocide at the same time, it was almost as if there were two separate worlds. Um, and then I started seeing all these similarities and I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm reading a lot about serial murders committed during genocides, but yet for some reason it, it seems that those that are studying genocides are not really studying serial murder and those that are studying serial murder not really studying genocide. So it's a lonely area to be researching and you know trying to put things together. Uh, that's what I've been trying to do and that's why um, this is really preliminary work, a pilot study and hopefully you know to get some uh, thought going and other people taking some interest, uh, critiquing my research, adding to it. My big question here is how quickly can someone move through the violentization process and I'll talk about that in a moment, the violentization process, and can stages be skipped, and what factors seem to facilitate a more rapid movement. This gets back to my question in regards to serial murder, and, and that is, um, how long does it take for someone, in other words, if you look at uh, the statistics in our chapter, and you look at the age of, uh, the average age of the first uh, kill for um, serial killer or uh, the average length of time or the median length of time, whatever the case might be, you know, you find in some cases we have, um, you know, teenagers who become serial murderers, in other cases, uh, young adults, middle-aged adults, what, what happens? What if, you know, they take a break for a while sometimes, sometimes they don't, and sometimes they seem to stop, we're not sure what happened. So there's all these questions. And so I almost go back to say, um, back to my earlier um, roots in developmental uh, clinical work, and that is how does this process of someone becoming a serial murder uh, occur? Um, it, you know, are there certain neurological or social or and or environmental factors that occur on the way? Well, violentization theory was developed by Lonnie Athens, Professor Athens, and this traces the process of how people become violent perpetrators. Um, Anything written by Lonnie Athens, I highly recommend you read. Just um, uh, uh, just an amazing um, amount of research generated there. Also, um, there is a book by um, uh, Richard Rhodes, Why They Kill, which details case studies and explains uh, this uh, violentization theory. He has another book on the uh, Eitzengruppen, the um, uh, the Nazi police who killed thousands and thousands and thousands of innocent civilians uh, during World War II. And um, also uh, there's a documentary, uh, Why They Kill, which is available on Amazon Prime and other 
and Vimeo and other outlets, which details voluntization theory. Just in, in, in general, the stages of the voluntization process in, include um, brutalization, which is observing violence. So here people um, observe others engaging in violent behavior. The second, uh, the second stage is defiance or developing a supportive belief system for the use of violence. So here the person begins to uh, have this idea that violence is okay, violence is appropriate to use. And then the third uh, stage is violent dominance engagement, where the person participates in violent behavior. And they may do this on their own, or they may do this in um, a group. And then virulency is when the person defines themselves as a violent person, a tough person, a person who's not going to take anything, person to be feared. So they have this self-image of this violent, dangerous person, individual. And then the fifth stage was added later on, violent predation, which is extreme violent behavior, which we see among serial murders, which we see among ge genocide perpetrators. So I have a case study here. Um, Goran Jelesic, and uh, this is his face sheet. All of this is available from um, the um, International Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia. You can get that online, and there's um, a lot of cases. I've been analyzing some of these cases using each individual uh, uh, perpetrator as a case study and trying to compare and contrast. Uh, so this is, um, you know, you can find this and the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia website, all kinds of uh, information, the court transcripts, the indictments, and, and so forth. So, Jelesic was a prison camp leader during the Bosnian genocide, and he pled guilty to war crimes and crimes against humanity during the trial at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And some of these crimes included killing 13 people over a three-week period, and also uh, witness testimony and mental health assessments were used in my research and study from court documents to apply violentization theory to Gillespie's um, violent behavior. Uh, just a brief background: at the time of the murders, he was 23-year-old farm mechanic who traveled from the from um, his town to assist with the separation of Muslim and Croatian uh, citizens. And it's unclear from what I've read how he actually became a prison camp leader. Um, looking at his court documents, I did not find any previous uh, history of violent behavior on his part. Um, but based on witness testimony in uh, the court documents that he reached the violent predation stage as described by Professor Athens. So in this extreme uh, violent, uh, virulent behavior. So in this stage, the person engages in extremely violent behavior, uh, such as psychological, <clears throat> psychological abuse and humiliation, instilling great fear, torture, mutilation of bodies, sexual violence, severe beatings, and, and murder. Um, and this, I think we would, you know, basically this would also fit what we call in our course serial murder, serial killing. Interesting feature is it appears that he did this rapidly over a two or three week period. So that is where I began to start questioning all these different factors and is it even appropriate to compare Pair serial murders from our class uh, in our case studies, for example, and uh, in another um, uh, study I compared um, uh, the Green River uh, killer Gary Ridgway to um, uh, a another Bosnian uh, perpetrator who was found guilty of a bunch of crimes, and and so it's you know again I'm really uh, this is the beginning phases of of this research. So psychological factors, we had some of um, his psychological data in the um, court transcripts in the interview, uh, I'm sorry, in the uh, testimony of the mental health professionals. Now his defense said that um, he, the defense presented as, quote, seriously diminished psychological responsibility, end of quote, in relationship to several mental disorders. And that in addition, he was acting under the orders of his superiors. 
So um, the prosecution, though, uh, dismissed these two mitigating circumstances. They threw them out. So Jelesic went on beyond the level of violence needed. For example, and this is from the court documents, he beat prisoners over several days prior to killing them and frequently terrorized prisoners by forcing them to watch executions. He also forced prisoners to sing Serbian songs in front of the Serbian flag. He showed a consistent method of killing the citizens. Um, for example, he killed five citizens at the police station. And this is to quote from the prosecutor versus Goran Jelicic, 1999, paragraph 37, from the court transcripts. In an always identical manner, which was described by the accused himself, having undergone an interrogation, the victims were placed in the hands of the accused, who would then out to an alley near the police station, who took them out to an alley near the police station. The accused executed them generally with two bullets in the back of the neck fired from a scorpion pistol fitted with a silencer. Alori then came to gather up the bodies. According to the accused, these murders were committed over a period of two days. Another victim, and to quote from uh, Prosecutor Verse Gordon uh, Jelesic, 1999, paragraph 39, another victim, was severely beaten before being executed. It appears that her executioners wanted to find out where her brother and father members of the police forces before the war were hiding. She was handcuffed to a signpost and then beaten with long truncheons by several policemen for the whole day. The victim's clothes were torn and covered with blood. That evening, she was brought back to the hangar and covered with bruises and moaning with pain. The accused returned for her the next morning and executed her in the same fashion as he had his other victims. So in this case, you're beginning to see emerge the possibility of team serial killers or genocide perpetrators in this case. And there's also a situation um, from paragraph uh, 42 um, in the court document that during a violent act, Jelicic, quote, returned after approximately 10 minutes. His shirt was stained with blood. He explained, I just killed a man from 50 centimeters away. I cut off his ear. He didn't want to talk like you. The accused then slashed the victim's two forearms with a knife before again beating him with a club. Goran Jelicic next made the victim take out his papers and his money. None of his identity papers gave any indication that he was Muslim. The accused then became angry and asked why the two brothers had been brought to Luka. He ordered their immediate release. So this is an interesting situation of misidentification where he was about to torture um, and then kill, and then he stopped and let him go, let the two uh, victims go. This is what Fox, Levin, and Friedel in 2019 kind of refer to as um, the compartmentalization. And um, uh, in their book on page 76, uh, Fox, Levin, and Friedel 2019 state that serial killers are able to compartmentalize their attitudes toward people by conceiving of at least two categories of human beings, those whom they care about and treat with decency and those with whom they have no relationship and therefore can victimize with total disregard for their feelings. End of quote from page 76 of their book on on, um, on killing. And, and here what we get is the whole interesting idea, because a lot of times we see with the serial murders in our textbook, we also see in the genocidal perpetrators that they seem to be living dual lives, that they're able to uh, go home to a family, maybe uh, have kids even, and function fine in, 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 in employment settings, but then they go off to their killings, and it's a whole other scenario. In the genocidal cases, it was where they were actually conducting their work, which uh, is a very different situation there. We also see hatred and dehumanization uh, occurring, and there's some other features of the case that um, uh, that uh, report. And um, he actually identified himself as uh, Adolf to the pr prisoners after Adolf Hitler. Um, and then quoting from page, um, par I'm sorry, paragraph 104 from the uh, transcripts. Prosecutor vs. Gorn, Jelesic, 1999, in regards to his power and pleasure he obtained from his violence, which again we see with serial murder cases, he seemed to take pleasure from his position, 
one which gave him a feeling of power, of holding the power of life or death over the detainees, and that he took a certain pride in the number of victims that he had allegedly executed. Spoke in bloodthirsty manner, he treated them like animals or beasts, and spittle formed on his lips because of his shouts and the hatred he was expressing. He wanted to terrorize them. And so we also see that pattern in the cases in our textbook with um, uh, you know, serial killers in, uh, in, in many of the cases. And in regards to his psychological profile, um, this is from um, Prosecutor Vers Gorin Lesich, uh, 1999, paragraph 105. It was reported that he had a disturbed personality. Gorin Lesich led an ordinary life before the conflict. This personality, which represents borderline antisocial and narcissistic characteristics, and which is marked simultaneously by immaturity, a hunger to fill a void, and a concern to please superiors, contributed to his finally committing crimes. Jelesic suddenly found himself in an apparent position of authority for which nothing had prepared him. It matters little whether this authority was real. What does matter is that this authority made it even easier for an opportunistic and inconsistent behavior to express itself. So this gets into, we see that parallel with uh, the serial killers in our serial killer textbook of um, the personality disturbances, antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic, for example, borderline. But then all of a sudden, you know, the whole situation is different. The serial killer doesn't get themselves in this um, supportive situation of being able to carry out that, the murders. So, so there's some difference there. Uh, but the psychological profile seems similar. The environmental conditions um, are somewhat different. In terms of remorse, the court found Jelesic uh, no remorse, and um, also their photographs online you can see through um, the International Criminal Tribunal of him actually committing some of the executions. Um, using Athens' violentization model, as I mentioned before, Jelesic appeared to rapidly move through the violent into the violent predation stage within you know a couple of weeks. These findings are consistent with other research, for example, Zimbardo's 2007 prison experiment. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> that experiment was done much longer uh, than that. But Zimbardo's 2007 book detailing his much previous um, famous prison experiment and also his Abu Ghraib abuse research. So so he was talking about his earlier famous prison experiment, but it was in his published 2007 book. In addition, these findings partially parallel the findings found in research that I and my colleagues have conducted on violentization uh, theory. So, we want to know how Jelesic progressed through other stages and internalized the killer script. That's still, you know, to see how he moved rapidly through that. Um, I wish I had better data you know, ideally, I'd be able to interview Jelesic and ask him from a developmental perspective from all these different points on how one thing led to another, how things progressed, and so forth. Also, during the time of the murders, he was in the middle of an ethnic cleansing taking place in his surroundings and um, part of a malignant community, which was characterized by many, many violent interactions within a very chaotic environment. That's not the case in many of the serial murders that cases that we see. So that's a big difference there in looking at uh, the communities and the environmental conditions. He was also assigned the role of a killer, which he seemed to adjust to and, and um, uh, like, and his peers had already completed the violentization process. So there may be some useful uh, data here to bring into studying team um, serial killers that we'll focus on later in our text, but primarily now we're focusing on, in this section, the male serial murderer, and the other case that I detail is the Green River Killer, Gary Ridgway. So you have kind of compare and contrast to uh, male serial killers here. Limitations, obviously one case is presented, and uh, as I mentioned, I'm working on more. Unfortunately, I tend to work fairly slow in, in, the, in this research because um, I'm always finding something new, going over here, going over there, putting it aside, rethinking things. Um, uh, I, I wish I didn't have to sleep at all. I'd, I'd get a lot more work done. And also the time frames are not clearly available. You know, I'll, I mean, ideally I'd want almost an hour by hour scenario of that, you know, those two to three weeks to see how everything progressed. 
And also the study interpretations are based on perpetrator statements and also witness testimony as well as mental health assessments. Uh, so of course I didn't have first, um, uh, you know, interview knowledge that I, because I didn't conduct any interviews myself. So um, some of the questions I would have, and maybe these relate also to uh, studying serial murder, is what did they do right before they took on that role of uh, killer? What was going on in the environment? Uh, you know, what was he told to do versus um, what do uh, the serial killers decide to do? Or what happens in team serial killing? One person tells another person uh, to do. Now, we also ask, in this case, was he automatically a member of a violentized group, that the group was already there? Because we want to also ask if serial killers, how they become violentized and go through that, that process. Um, and how did his self-image change? We want to look at that among the genocide perpetrators as well as those that have um, uh, committed uh, the, the crimes in, 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 in genocide, serial killers and genocide perpetrators, and also what were his future plans. So that's kind of a, a real quick overview of, of the um, study that I presented at the Homicide Research Working Group in, uh, in, in, in 2019. Um, you know, again, you know, basically we're looking at male serial murders here, right? And, and um, now here we have a male and, and some might say um, that maybe this is even mass murder and not serial murder, but I, I go with serial murder, but you're talking about two to three weeks. And so you know that a lot of times those debates over time frames come into play. I'm not going to ask you on an exam whether it was serial murder or mass murder, because then you and I will be uh, debating it, and that makes it extremely difficult. And it may, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, there's a separated time period, but... It's kind of unusual, isn't it, in, in, in that regard, and especially with, with um, you know, the lack of really having a clear time, uh, you know, situation. Or was it basically, you know, was it two or three different mass murders that, you know, we get into all these different scenarios. And I don't want to make things more complex uh, with, with, this, um, with these definition uh, arguments or debates. I'm just going to go with serial murder. But if you told me several mass murders, I would not disagree with you. Um, okay, and this uh, wraps uh, this up. If you're watching this um, outside of the class, I hope it was um, useful. And, and I, um, I'll try to post the uh, references in the comment section for you so you can see you know, the material that I, I used and, and get that if, if you're interested in pursuing that further. For those that are inside the class, I'll post a, um, a PowerPoint in uh, your web course. And this wraps up uh, this video. Thank you very much.